Several weeks ago I had been asked to speak at a harvest festival. It was the first time that I had done such a thing, but I remember well from my childhood days special times like this when we would say thank you to God for the harvest. We would bring along fruit and vegetables from the garden and other things besides to be given to others who were less fortunate than ourselves. I've actually brought along a couple of things from my garden today, although the bulk of this year's harvest is uh, is already well past. So, um, yes, here's a rather fancy squash, uh, a patty pan squash from the garden, and another um, uh, delightful uh, character there, and uh, a, a tomato, um, one of many, not a squashed one, of course, and uh, oh, got a couple of carrots, and there we go. Well, um, of course, if you're um, if you're listening to this on the podcast, um, then well, you'll just need to take my word for it that these are, of course, perfect examples. <clears throat> Now, I'm really not a terribly good gardener. It's not that I don't enjoy it. I actually do, but I I just don't really seem to have as much time for it as I would like. I think that one of the things I enjoy most about gardening is simply watching things grow ever so slowly, bit by bit, day by day, from tiny seeds into something one can harvest and then eat. That is, when things work out the way they should. But all of this takes some effort. At times, leaving one with aches and pains, but effort is needed, along with our cooperation with our Father in heaven. And this is the bit that I've learned to enjoy the most. You know, we sow the seeds, we water the plants, but God is the one who makes them grow, each one of them. And he is the one who makes them fruitful. The idea of harvest is one that inextricably involves the hand of God at work. So, whenever we grow things, we should remember that we are working in harmony, in cooperation with our Creator. I suppose the idea of harvest is less thought of these days, partly because fewer people grow their own produce, perhaps, and maybe also because we have become accustomed to buying food from overseas. So we're rather used to eating whatever we like at whatever time of year we want to eat it, not needing to wait until it's in season. The first time we read of harvest in the scriptures is just after the flood, as God was making a covenant with every living creature, he said, while the earth remains, Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Of course, the principle is uh, um, certainly older than the flood. Um, we read of it in one way or another in the garden. Uh, but following their deliverance from Egypt, and their possession of the land promised to their ancestors, the nation of Israel, the ancient nation of Israel, were to observe an annual feast of harvest, also known as the Feast of Weeks, and later as Pentecost, its Greek name. 
Well, this was a time of great rejoicing for the people of God. It was a, a time of thanksgiving and of dedication. The land which God had given to Israel was a land flowing with milk and honey, a fruitful land with pomegranates and figs and huge clusters of grapes, like the one brought back by the spies whom Moses had sent to spy out the land. There was evidence of agriculture all around, and like most ancient peoples, they enjoyed a close and dependent relationship with the land, and they understood the, the processes involved. Unlike today, when apparently significant numbers of children in so-called developed countries couldn't tell you where basic food items come from, such as milk or cheese or even potatoes, those living BCS, that is, before the convenience of supermarkets, were more than familiar with such things on a daily basis. The Israelites were particularly renowned for their vineyards. In fact, the vine became something of a symbol of Israel and had been very much a part of the culture um, from their earliest days. It, it symbolized the nation at its best as a fruitful nation, bearing fruit to the praise and glory of its God. It spoke of prosperity, and it spoke of blessing, and the image is still used today by the Israeli Ministry of Tourism. Not that there's much of that going on at the moment, of course. The vine is a recurring motif in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and since the time of Isaiah, some 700 years before the times of Jesus, it has almost always represented the nation of Israel, particularly the nation at home, in the land God had promised to their ancestors. Isaiah was one of many voices that God used to speak to his people, reminding them of his steadfast love and his undying faithfulness. In the opening pages of his book, the prophet Isaiah sings a song for his beloved friend about his vineyard. Now, if I knew the tune, I would sing it for you, of course, but you'd no doubt rather I didn't. So, here are the words. My friend had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug the soil and cleared it of stones. He planted the finest vines. He built a tower to guard them, dug a pit for treading the grapes. He waited for the grapes to ripen, but every grape was sour. Mm. Such promise! and yet such terrible disappointment. So what will he do with his vineyard? Well, he tells us. He'll take away the hedge around it and break down the wall that protects it and let wild animals eat it and trample it down. Then he'll let it be overgrown with weeds. He won't trim the vines or hoe the ground. Instead, he'll let briars and thorns cover it, and he won't even let the clouds rain on it. And why will he do all this? Because, the prophet explains, 
the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines in which he delighted. He looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. This vineyard is the vineyard of God, and the vineyard of the Lord Almighty was the nation of Israel. The finest vines he planted were his people, and this song which the prophet sings for his beloved friend, well, it's really a parable, or if you like, a, a parabolic song. It's a story about a disappointed farmer who has done everything he possibly could do to ensure a good grape harvest, but who ends up with a rotten crop. And I don't know what is your expertise in the field of gardening, but there are times when I've ended up with rotten crops too. Although, I confess, I haven't gone to the same extent of destruction as in Isaiah's song, though there are times when significant portions of the garden have been overrun with briars and thorns and weeds. But we should move on, for this is intended to, or I should say this is not intended to be a horticultural or, or botany lesson. No, no. Later, later, God would say through the prophet Jeremiah, Yet I planted you a choice vine, wholly of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? And around about the same time, the prophet Ezekiel told a parable um, about a vine that bore no fruit. It was useless. Even the wood of the vine was less use than a useless thing that had no use. It wasn't really even much use for burning, although that was all that one could do with this fruitless vine wood. And you'll find that parable in uh, uh, chapter 15 of uh, the most intriguing book of the prophet Ezekiel. Well, all of this, all of this, the song of the prophet Isaiah, this parable told by the prophet Ezekiel, the words we read of the prophet Jeremiah, all of this sets the scene for a rather striking picture which Jesus paints shortly before his arrest and execution. You may recall Jesus had been in an upstairs room with his students, his disciples. He's washed their dirty feet and has spoken of his undying love for the Father and of his faithfulness towards those who love him. It seems like they are about to leave that upstairs room and make their way out of the city towards a garden on the other side of the valley. But Jesus continues to speak to his students. I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and... I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. 
there's no doubt that the passages to which we have referred from the prophets would have been well known to his students, and they would have clearly understood the significance of what he was saying here. They knew that Israel was the vineyard of God, but here was Jesus claiming to be the true vine himself, the vineyard of God that was the nation of Israel never lived up to its potential. The prophet Isaiah sang his song of God's vineyard that was so full of promise, but every grape was sour. The prophet Jeremiah told how God had planted a, a choice vine, wholly of pure seed, but it became degenerate and a, a wild vine. But here is Jesus, the Son of God, claiming to be the true vine. He's the, the real thing, if you like. He's all that Israel was ever meant to be, but all that they never were. In every way, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He was the, the, the real substance of God, where Israel had been merely a, a poor shadow and a very imperfect one at that. So as Jesus approaches the end of his life on earth, he wants his students to know that not only must they remain faithful to him, but that they must become a very part of him. We need to remain in him. Failure to do so would be tragic, and failure to do so would render them and us fruitless. And fruitless branches are useless and fit only for the bonfire where they're burned up. I am the vine, he continues. You, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit, because apart from me you can accomplish nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown out like a branch and dries up, and such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and are burned up. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is honoured by this, that you bear much fruit and show that you are my disciples. Isn't that a beautiful picture of fruitfulness? Huh? The fruitfulness of, of, of remaining in. It, it, it's a picture of growing intimacy with God and of our utter dependence upon him. I'm taken back to my garden to when I sowed the seeds and watered the plants, but all along it was and still is God making things grow. And so it is with us. We are completely, totally, utterly dependent upon God for all that we are, all we ever do. We, we want to live our lives that bring honour to God, that, that glorify God. But we simply cannot do that by ourselves. Yes, there, there may be a, a great deal of effort involved. But at the end of the day, it is a matter of cooperation, of dependence on our part upon God, who will do his part within us. Isn't that amazing? Un unless the Spirit of God dwells within us by faith, then we will never bear fruit. Paul later writes of the fruit of the Spirit of God, fruit that is produced by God in the lives of those 
who give their whole being to him. And there's a delightful progression in this teaching of Jesus here in John chapter 15, from bearing fruit to bearing more fruit to bearing much fruit, all by remaining in him as he is within us. And all of this because of his love. Jesus went on to say, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. 